Welcome to Motorcycles and Coffee. Today we're having tea with Lisa and Jason. Lisa and Jason are world travelers. A few years ago I got an email from Lisa asking if we're interested in their world traveler stories. We got quite a few requests and I gave them a usual reply which was let's see some photos first. Within a few minutes she sent some photos and I almost fell off my chair. I couldn't respond quick enough. The bonus was that the writing was top-notch as well. Fast forward a few years, you have seen the stories in the magazine, you have seen them on our website, and we're very happy to announce that they are going to embark on their trip 2.0 aboard two KTMs. But before we even get to that, let's just talk about the original one, the very first world trip on their motorcycles. Lisa, Jason, welcome. Thank you very much. Hello. Isn't it a nice evening for chat in our outdoor living room? It's beautiful. It and I love your office, can I just say. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Absolutely. We couldn't have made this work better, the fact that you're here in North Carolina. Not by complete coincidence, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, let's let the viewers learn a little bit more about you. Uh, tell us. How did you get into motorcycling um, and how did you get started on the very first trip? Oh wow, there's a... Well, I, I, I've been riding bikes since I was 17 and uh, when I met Lisa um, I had a, a sports bike and I think that was your first introduction to motorcycles. Yeah, on the back of your Honda Blackbird. And then... Uh, 23 years ago. And then you won a uh, competition for a taster session at a bike show. I actually won the runner-up prize, yeah. To sample two hours on a 50cc automatic. So it's like a motorcycle, but it was a toy, which was perfect for me. So long story short, I ended up taking my test, passing first time, and jumping aboard an F650 GS. That was your very first motorcycle then, the F650? Yeah, as soon as I passed my test on a 125, I then upgraded to the 650, which was a bit of a jump, if I'm honest. Um, I had to restrict the engine because of the rules back then in the UK. It was 47 brake horsepower was the maximum. So yeah, for the that first one. two years, you can't <laughs> ride, once you pass your test, you can't, you can't ride a bike more powerful than 47 brake horsepower. Yeah. After you got your driver's license for the motorcycle, when did the idea come about to ride around the world? I think we were, there was nothing fundamentally wrong with our lives back in the UK, you know, we, we had good jobs, you know, we lived in a nice house, but there was just that calling. We've always had itchy feet. We've, in fact, we met whilst we were traveling. So we've, we've always got, we've always had that nomadic uh, part of us. And I think that we'd got a little bit comfortable back in the UK after a few years of backpacking around the world and we just wanted to go off and do something different. More traveling but on a motorcycle instead of you know by foot or by, by bus or by train. Did you consider other modes of transportation first or how did you arrive at motorcycles? You and Charlie I think watching their long way round, long way up long way down, all of those, w watching those two, making it possible for people like us, paving the way and thinking, okay, well, if they're on BMWs, I guess that must be the weapon of choice to do this kind of trip. And just understanding that you can actually connect all the dots on a motorcycle and travel from country to country, which was totally new news to us. <laughs> How much planning did you put into the first trip? Did it Was it a matter of a couple of months and you were on the road? Did it take years? It didn't take long. We knew that the Americas was, for us, was easier to travel through. There isn't one country where you need a carne, for example, which is like a passport for your motorcycle. Um, and that's expensive as well because you have to put a bond down. Um, and, the, and the Americas seemed like the obvious choice for us to cut our teeth. So we started off in the Americas, um, yeah. How did you get your motorcycles to your starting point? 
So because I just passed my test, um, I actually had the same turning circle on my bike as the mode of transport that took us to South America, which was on a container ship. So we rode our bikes from the UK, my mum's doorstep, over to Antwerp in Belgium, and then ro literally rolled onto this container ship, which was 200 meters long, 13 decks, 32 meters across, and it took 27 days to go from Belgium to Uruguay. That alone was an adventure already. It really was, yeah. And life aboard a container ship is nothing like you'd imagine. It was amazing. It was a really good way to decompress, I would say, after you know, quite a busy and intense planning period, although it did take us longer to save than actually to plan for this trip, I would say. Um, of course, I had no benchmark either. I'd, re I'd just passed my test, so I was totally thrown in at the deep end. But because I had no benchmark, I didn't know any different. It's almost sometimes the best way to go. When you, when you don't know what you're letting yourself in for. Yeah. And talking about your photography and your writing, were you always into photography and were you always into writing? Uh, I've always been into, interested in photography. Um, my first passion was scuba diving. So I would take a camera underwater. And for 10 years, that, that was, for me was, scuba diving was just a means to get underwater to take pictures. So there's always been a strong photographic element to most sports that I take up, I want to video it, I want to record it, I want to take pictures of it. So taking, ca taking a camera on a bike trip was just, it was a natural progression for me. Yeah, and how about you, Lisa? What about the writing part? Did you always journal? Yes, I've always journaled. I've always um, put out online um, in the old fashioned days where you had a travel blog um, and studied English in school. And it was just a natural progression. So by the time we got on the container ship, I'd asked a couple of magazines if they were interested in a and a about life aboard a container ship. Um, and one, of, one publication in the UK jumped at the chance to, you know, have me express what that was like. Um, and I really took it from there. It just grew and grew until the point where we're at now, really. When you left home, did you have the idea already in your mind to to sell your work to publications around the world or did that come on the container ship? Yeah, I would say that only happened once we started the trip proper through South America. I had no idea that it would lead to, you know, being able to say that we're established freelance writers and photographers now. I, I didn't know it would take off like it has. It's a really happy accident. I think it's always uh, better to spend a few months, if not years on the road already and have something in your back pocket and then try to get your work published. It's very difficult yeah. to do ahead of time if you have mm. nothing to show. You have no photos to show, no writing samples. Yeah. So, okay, so on the road is, is yeah. always Well, you don't better. have any credibility. You, you can say, you can be as enthusiastic as you want, but unless you've got something to back it up, it's, it's a lot more difficult to, to try and generate any kind of income from this kind of travel and unless to, you've been doing it for a while. To springboard off what you've just said as well, I think for, for me, having our uh, travel blog, our little website, was a really great opportunity to start uh, writing something up to four times a month. It was never actually a chore to write you know, our stories. And then um, all of a sudden, I just found that People were interested, in, you know, publications were expressing interest in taking that off us, you know, in gift wrap content and either publishing it online and or in print. Um, it was just a really great way to start to start building that. Um, yeah, it was it was um, it was fun doing that. What's your favorite magazine to write for? Oh, yeah, there's there's a small one called Roadrunner. Um, I don't know if you've heard of. Yeah, no, I quite like writing for them. Let's uh, hear it from your side of how our uh, working partnership uh, started. Let's hear how it, how it went from your side. It's so long ago. I, I, I just feel that what you said was quite accurate. I can't really remember. <laughs> I think, yeah, we, I did make the initial approach. Is that what I did? Did I not actually attach any pictures? No, it's, um, I don't think so. It's not, oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you, you, you sent an email asking if we are interested in some stories yeah. and I gave the usual reply of let's see some photos first and yeah within a few minutes I think you did send some photos oh, and good. I almost fell off my chair. 
And I was like, okay, yeah, real quick, right back. Yes, boy. I'll take it all. <laughs> and uh, then we quickly hashed out a plan for which stories. And yeah, and I think within weeks, you actually sent all of the text even. I don't know how you were able to write that quickly. Um, and yeah, bonus was that the writing was fantastic too. Thank you. That, that's what I was going to say, actually, before when when I was writing four times a month, um, just about, you know, the, the motorcycling in the Americas, it was, for me, the reason I, I wanted to do this so badly was I didn't want my brain to go to mush. Like, I actually needed a creative outlet like Jason's, and I just needed something for me um, that was totally something that, where, you know, a division of labour wouldn't overlap, and it was all something that I could call my own. And Jason had his, you know, Jason takes care of the visuals, I take care of the words. And I, I absolutely love that. Like, I never expect Jason to, you know, have to write out the deep caption or, you know, the article. And likewise, Jason never really expects me to, you know, kind of spot a stunning composition because I couldn't spot one if it actually jumped out and gave me a haircut. So I'm just not that way inclined. That's not how my brain's wired at all. Yeah, I like, I just love the fact we've both got a skill set each that we can bring to the table and really add value. Um, it makes it quite strong when you put it together as well because sometimes it's either one or the other where you're stronger, isn't it? So it's it's very fortunate. Yeah, and you've uh, been together for a long time and if you've traveled together for a long time, so as soon as you hit the road, you're a well-oiled machine. Yeah, we are. Everybody has their, their job and their duty and it's very easy, probably don't even have to speak to each other and everything is set up. No. Blue jobs, pink jobs. We're quite lucky because we're quite passionate, well, we are passionate about, you know, I'm passionate about the visuals and Lisa's passionate about producing great words and, uh, and that keeps us going. It, 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 you know, we, we don't see it as a chore. We don't see it as something that, you know, we're, we're trying to, to sort of, uh, we drag our feet, you know, when we're trying to produce this kind of content. We just enjoy it. We don't see it as work. So it, for us, it's very easy to produce. Yeah, we really enjoy the process of, of what we like doing on the road. I'm always itching at the end of the day to stop riding so I can start writing. So I don't know if I ride to write or write to ride. It's, it's probably both. But I feel that, um, yeah, it works out. Now, one question readers always ask is, how can they afford to uh, travel around the world and do this for a living? Can, can you answer? How can you make this work? Uh, savings. You know, we go with that a lot to do this. We saved up for two years. We live well below our means. We're yeah. really frugal we, on we, everything. You know, no, no expensive meals out. You know, watching every penny for about two years. I knew we had to have a certain amount of cash that I was comfortable, we were comfortable with, that I thought would take us at least from the bottom of South America into the US. The idea of earning any extra income didn't even factor because at that time we weren't, we weren't producing anything. So it was purely based on savings and a small amount of money that we generated from renting our house out. So we relied on that money for, the, for most of our day-to-day -day living costs. And in South and Central America, that pretty much covered everything. So our budget then, in 2014, was 50 bucks a day. On most days, we would put gas in both bikes. That would be food and accommodation. And we wouldn't even spend that some days. We live like kings in Argentina. Yeah, 50 bucks a day. Yeah. 50 bucks a day yeah. for per, per person spend, or total? No, total. We couldn't actually spend all of that some days. We had money left over. We didn't actually do that much camping in South America because accommodation was so cheap. Mm. And it was cold because we were constantly following um, like the autumn season, I would say. Right. The time of year that we yeah. set off. Right. We're from from reading your travel stories, it always did seem like you're always riding when it's ice cold outside. Yeah. <laughs> well, we arrived in uh, the bottom of South America just as uh, winter had set in. And then when we left, uh, no, I'm telling you wrong, actually. Mar March. We arrived just before winter, so it was, it was autumn. Then we left and we started heading north. Of course, as, as we're heading north, the season is following us. So we had this, what seemed like, like... Constant a, autumn. A constant autumn, yeah, a constant fall. But it was beautiful. Fall. So we cold. were seeing, seeing the, changes, the changes of the leaves as we were traveling north. When did you come up with the name Four Wheel Nomad? Was this, again, before, during, after, um, and why four wheels? Uh, <clears throat> good question. Um, we started off as Two Wheeled Nomad, which made a lot more sense. <laughs> 
and then we decided that we would we would transition from two wheels to four wheels so we did five years in a truck so we changed the name and then we felt like we couldn't change it back again so now we're stuck with four Only wheel nomad two wheel nomad had been taken <laughs> <laughs> so we gave up the domain name. We gave up the domain name, and then somebody bought it. Yeah. So so somebody bought it. Um, not that I would have probably changed it back anyway. Um, but anyway, it still makes sense, sort of, because there's two of us and there's four wheels. Absolutely. Yeah. So. No, it makes sense. Yeah. But why did we go to four wheels? That's a question for another interview. I agree. Your job. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> We didn't even get through the first one yet. Okay, back up a little bit. Yeah. You were on a container ship. Yeah. You went to South America. Mm -hmm. Where did you get off and what was your plan route? So we got off in Uruguay, Montevideo, and we rode all the way down to the bottom of South America to a, a city called Ushuaia. And then we took a little trip across to Antarctica because we were there and it's cheaper to do it like that than to organize something from, let's say, the US or the UK. And then we rode all the way up through South America, crisscrossing the Andes as we went, all the way up into Central America, into North America, all the way up into Canada, to Alaska, until the road just ran out in Prudhoe Bay. That yeah. took two and a half years. That took two and a half years? Yeah. How, how many years were you in South America? In South America? Uh, I think it was about 21 months in South America for. Yeah. What was the best part about South America? Oof. Hard one. Yeah. yeah. Argentina. Argentina. Yeah. Sites, people, food. I, all of it. All of the above. All of it. People first. Always people first. Um, so wild. Amazing landscapes. For me, amazing landscapes, amazing people, amazing food. You could get lo lost and never come back if you wanted to in Argentina. It's still that wild. And, and traveling is not all a bunch of uh, Instagram-worthy shots, right? So surely there were some bad days on the road or some places where you were like, eh, expected more. Did you come across any uh, places that left you a little bit disappointed? Disappointed? I don't know what... The, to be honest with you, I didn't know what to expect. And of course, after, after a period of time, you, you know, you start comparing the, the amazing beach you saw previous to this one and the amazing landscapes you know the, the amazing mountain range well that one wasn't quite as good as the one we saw down in patagonia or you know the short answer is uh, we didn't really have any expectations so and that is the best way to travel and just a good outlook in life low expectations and you'll never be disappointed sure, i actually right. uh, wrote a letter for the magazine just about this topic because um, with my part-time work as a tour guide, sometimes I ran into some people that had such high expectations and always felt like those guests were very difficult to please, not just from my standpoint, but themselves. If you have such high expectations and always expect, expect certain things, then it's very difficult to be happy. As opposed to if you come in, you know, not expecting anything, just seeing how it goes, you'll always be better off. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Always, always I'd finding the that. positive and the joy in, yeah, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, for sure. When you were in South America, were there a few moments where you felt unsafe at all, ever? Never. Never. So if we ever did get an inkling that uh, we weren't comfortable staying the night while camping in a certain spot, you know, sometimes you just, your, your gut instinct kicks in and your spidey senses start tingling, then we would just simply jump back on the bike ride 20 miles down the road, even five miles down the road, get a comfortable feeling again in our gut and stay. Yeah, but, at, at but any point did you ever think you might need a, um, a bike cover or a lock? <laughs> we, those bike covers at the start of the trip were we, we an had, invisibility we, cloak. They yeah. were amazing. Yeah. Like we never used locks actually, but we used bike covers until they got destroyed by the Patagonian wind. We used them all the time. They were invaluable. But you had a bigger bike. That is we it. had a bigger bike. We had, we had more space to carry it. Which were worth a lot less. No. T talking about space carrying on motorcycles, did everybody carry their own stuff or did you split it up differently? My bike was the pack mule. My bike got to carry all the camping gear for us both. What did your bike carry, Jace? I, I carried all the fun stuff like cameras and drones and yeah. So no, it wasn't even Stephen's division of labour there. 
That, that... Uh, mine was a workhorse and his was just playing at it, just carrying cameras, tech, lenses, drones. Anything ever get destroyed by the vibration of the bikes? Uh... We lost the odd bolt and screw and things like that. We, I don't think so, no. I don't think any tech got destroyed, did it? No. What bike were you on? I don't think I've asked you this. Uh, I was on a BMW, BMW F800 GS. Yeah, and you on the 650 GS yeah, and I, for I went, a while. Yeah, I went out for a lowered model um, and, and honestly um, chose the partic this particular model because the, the blue of the bike perfectly matched my helmet. That is a wonderful reason to choose a, a motorcycle. Rider, I thought that, that was important to be coordinated. Absolutely. And I named her Pearl she was an older lady and built a whole online persona around her. She was, she just got me from the bottom to the top of the planet. I owe a lot to that bike. Like I felt like so traitorous when I sold her. So you obviously had a little bit of uh, luggage capacity if you brought bike covers along. Were there any uh, items you brought along that were purely for luxury and something to indulge in that you brought along? I don't know if a seat is a luxury, but the amount of stuff we could bring was, was so limited that I had to bring something that you know would be comfortable to sit on that was for me was a luxury everything else was just a necessity you're talking about your air hawk seat no I'm talking about um, the actual two-legged chair that we bought oh, <laughs> oh it was a two-legged chair it was a two-legged chair yeah, yeah I, I have a two-legged uh, two chair it's very difficult to balance on <laughs> did you enjoy those <laughs> um I got getting in it is quite difficult you can camp but once you're on in a it, hill, it's fine. You can sit on this thing on a hill. But Who doesn't want to do that? It's, yeah, it's a strange... The only benefit is you could, on sleep, the flat. You, could, you could sit on a slope. Yeah. But then again, why would you? Because yeah, most right. campsites would be fairly flat, wouldn't You'd they? You'd want them, yeah. Flat. Yeah. So for the upcoming trip, there's you don't have a... a we two don't have a two-legged chair. You no. have a... Chair yeah. Zero. It's the lightest one on the market. Absolutely. Yeah. What's it called? It's a Helinox chair, okay. chair Zero. Very cool. Not tried it out yet. Okay, so Chase and brought a chair. Do you have any items that you brought along? Hair straighteners. <laughs> Hair straighteners? Yeah, that's okay. They don't take up too much room. They're this big. Yeah, they don't take up much room. Yeah, right. When you're on the road, are there um, certain things you indulge in? Because, of course, you, you sleep in tents. You, you know, you go from one hotel or in hostel to the next. Um, is there something that you you indulge in where you think, okay, once a day, I just got to have a really good cup of coffee or, you know, a nice warm soup. Is there, is there something that you do, maybe not every day, but try to do it regularly? Um, we do try and eat out now and again, for sure. Um, cooking for yourself all the time can, can be a little bit of a chore. But that was now and again. Um, the question was every day. Oh, every day. So you know, you're just regularly, not every day, but could be every week, every month. But just something that you indulge in. We both do a morning meditation. We both have coffee. Um, what else is necess a necessity? That's it, really. How do you make your camp coffee? We buy instant and add hot water with the beer can stove. Beer can stove. Yeah. Genius. Do you have any other stoves or is the beer can stove your go-to now? Uh, no, we have, uh, which really is a very similar design. It's a, called a solar stove where you put like sticks in and you can make, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a stove that we can just use the fuel that we find lying around or um, inside it we have like a little alcohol burner, which is very much the same design as the, the beer can stove. Mm. And then we have a little um, uh, gas burner, you know, camping gas burner. So we have, yeah. we have three forms of cooking. But the solar stove is quite big, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It, Round. It is, big. but we can we can put the. Uh, it, it's effectively like a, a transier burner that goes inside it. So you, that will sit inside it, um, and then the the little gas stove. It's about this big. Okay. Which is pretty small. I think I have a different solo stove. Oh, do you? I think you? Mine's, uh, mine's much bigger, yeah. but it also comes with a grill plate and all the other attachments. Oh, right. oh this is this is about yay big. Okay. Yeah. That's a, okay. about round. It will yeah. take about 10 minutes, though, for you to get a cup of coffee in you. It's not quick. A lot of sticks, a lot of leaves. This time of year, patience. not a problem. 
in North Carolina, never a problem to find some sticks and leaves, especially no. this time of year. No. Back to the route. Went up through South America, crossed. How did you get uh, across the Darien Gap? Uh, we took the last available ferry. The, uh, the of the day? Of, well, the season. It, it was really the last available ferry. It was the last sailing. They were going to take it out of commission. So we actually raced through Colombia to get the last ferry. But we were heading towards the Stelrat, and unfortunately they refunded us because there was a problem with the harbour master and whatever was going on at the time. We wanted to go on the Stelrat and, try and go across the Darien Gap that way. Um, but in the end, we, we, it meant we, we rushed through Colombia, only had five days, which really did shortchange us on that country. So yeah, from Panama to Cartagena. The Stell Rats are like a hundred year old uh, clipper. Oh, the other way around, sorry. Ship. Cartagena um, to Panama. Yeah. And uh, they take you out to the San Blast Islands. So it's a bit of a mini cruise as well. And it would have been a more romantic way to have traversed the Darien Gap. But you sleep in as hammocks, Lisa was saying, deck. You, uh, we, we couldn't go because of some dispute that was going off with the harbour master. The boat was... was uh, it was detained in the harbour, so we had no other choice but to take the ferry. And like I say, that was the last ferry, so we had to rush through Colombia to get it. And then through Central America, and then on uh, we went through Mexico, then we went to the Baja, and then through North America, uh, Canada, Alaska, uh, Prudhoe Bay, in a roundabout way. What was, what was something that surprised you about America, about the United States? Ooh. Oh, that's a really loaded question. We'll just stay diplomatic here. Because it's so different. I mean, coming from South America into Central America, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're in the United States. The expense. Um, what, after, what? After, after traveling through mm. South and Central America for nearly two years, I was, I was just, I wanted first world comfort and convenience. But of course, with that comes the cost. And our budget, of 50 bucks a day well we couldn't even get a motel for 50 bucks so as soon as we went across the border from mexico into the us uh, I, I couldn't believe how expensive it was so that was the that was the thing that shocked me straight away was just the cost yeah a patch of grass on a campsite would be like minimum 45 dollars so you're having to get a bit more creative with where you can legitimately and legally wild camp in the states um, also, um, I know we were like quite, quite desperate and yearning for some comfort at this point, but what happened was reverse culture shock. So you, you're leaving South America and Central, and then you you enter the States, and you know you you walk into somewhere like Costco, and you just want a pint of milk. And I ended up walking out without any milk because there was like a whole warehouse-sized aisle of milk, and, you know, and there was like I don't know how many choice. choices. So I just walked out totally overwhelmed. Costco will do that to you. Yeah, that was a learning curve right there. Right as soon as we got over, left Ducati um, and crossed into San Diego. And I remember at that border, it, going into the US, I had my temporary import permit, which obviously I needed to relinquish so that I was legitimately able to enter the States. And the first thing that the American US border official said to me, and I, all I'd said to him is, oh, excuse me, I just need to know where Mexican customs is. Where, where can I get rid of my temporary import permit? He said to me in response to that, don't worry, ma'am, you're safe now. Don't worry, you're safe. I'm like, <laughs> I still need to know where to get rid of this piece of paper. <laughs> where's Edwana? <laughs> where's, where's customs? It was a really bizarre comment. So that was strange. Yeah, especially because you never faced any danger there whatsoever. And I also realized that um, entering the US, I don't actually speak the same language as anyone here. I, I need translating. <laughs> I need somebody to translate for me. Very true. So I use a bunch of words which make sense to people from the UK, but make no sense to anybody here. I'm constantly doing that. I need to walk around with a laminated glossary of terms. Yeah, are you dialing back the Britannisms? No, not really. <laughs> I should be, but I'm not. No, it's all good. It's cheating anyways. I always blame your good writing on Shakespeare. Um, you know, when you narrate some clips in your videos with your accents, totally cheating. Makes everything sound more interesting, smarter. Um, it's, yeah, it's cheating. Absolutely cheating. <laughs> 
we sound smarter than we are. <laughs> Keep at it because it's going to work. Do you look smarter than you are? <laughs> Do I look smarter than I am? <laughs> Doubt it. We sound smarter than we are. <laughs> <laughs> So when you came through America, then you uh, spent some time in Canada up to Prudhoe Bay and then you came back down and went over Canada? Yeah, we dropped into Canada for the winter. And I, I saw my bike, like I mentioned earlier, over to a Suzuki DR 650. Yeah. I felt like I'd outgrown Pearl. So that, that was in Happy Canada. Pearl. So we spent, we spent uh, six months in Canada over the winter. Of course, when the snows came, we couldn't go anywhere, which I didn't mind because I wanted to experience a Canadian winter anyway. It got as low as minus 54 Celsius at night. That's cold. We did you see some northern lights? Yes, we oh, did. Oh, yeah, we saw. Yukon, amazing. Layard Hot Springs. Whoa. They were orange and purple and red, not just green. It was stunning. Yeah, middle of the night. Yeah, for mm. sure. Very cool. So we ended up in Nova Scotia, and I think at that point we'd we knew that it was time to have a break because we stopped appreciating the places we were seeing and we ran we, out of steam i think yeah we ran out of steam after four and a half totally years travel so. Wary. so what's next why are you here in america um well we're doing another big bike trip uh this time because of the lessons we learned from the last trip we've decided to go lighter so we bought two ktm 500 excfs 2003 model no. 2023 model, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then we've heavily modified them because out of the box they're not great for long distance travel. So we've done that. And uh, in a week's time we'll be yeah. heading west. Heading west. Very mm. good. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about Lisa and Jason's trip, Check the link in the description or go to their website forwheelednomad.com. Mm -hmm.